Hey, for de definitions of English spoken without an accent. Yes, I was born not too far up the road, but I haven't lived there in ooh, 25 to nearly 30 years now. So things have moved on a little bit. So my accent's a little bit mellower now than people who are local. So I'm sure some people can probably understand me. Hopefully the people who are not from here can understand me. And you can forgive that I may be a bit snuffly because I've had a horrible cold for the last few days. So hopefully I get through this with my voice not working. So I want to cover a number of things here today, but I want to start off by sort of presenting one of my favorite quotes. I, I like to end some of my presentations with a quote, but I'm going to start this one with a quote, and this is a great one. And this is a great one from Henry Petrosky. It's the most amazing achievement of the computer software industry is its continuing cancellation of the steady and staggering gains by the computer hardware industry. This is unbelievably so true. I've seen a number of people have made such quotes and stuff. So I find that like, watching how computers have evolved and how we have evolved as an industry has been fascinating. I like to kind of think of it as we're living in the time of software alchemy, a bit like how physicists were in the 1600s. We're kind of making this up as we go. We're arguing with each other about how to do stuff. We often don't measure enough. We don't do proper science and engineering, which is something that's very much close to my heart. I make a living these days by making some of the systems in the world that process the highest volumes of transactions faster, more efficient, whatever. So I get to see some of the systems that do millions of transactions per second. And I find that it's actually not that hard to make some of them faster because we're just a little bit lax in how we do stuff when we don't follow some basic engineering. So I'm going to cover a little bit of this and a little bit of the reason to why we're where we are today. So I'm going to start off, I'm going to cover some fundamental laws of how our basic computers work and things that we should consider, and also a little bit of the history of itself. So Moore's Law, I guess everyone's heard of this. Have you heard of Moore's Law? Yeah, it's been around a while, kind of well-known. But is it, not, is it that well understood? Well, it was originally coined in 1965 when Gordon Moore talked about how transistor density doubles every year. This isn't when the law was kind of defined. We'll find with many things, the law is attributed often later on and usually by someone else. So Gordon Moore at Intel, 65. In 75, I was a little kid at this stage, and he was talking about how transistor densities are doubling every two years. So it actually changed his opinion of it at that stage. But this isn't where the law that most people have come to understand comes about from. There was another guy at Intel. So these were some of the founders of Intel. One of the others was David House. And he coined the phrase at this stage that CPUs double in speed every 18 months. He was taking the point of what Gordon had said is that the density is doubling every two years, but also the efficiency is increasing as well. So we're effectively getting CPUs that are twice as fast every 18 months. And so that's from 1975. So much of our industry got built upon that concept. Like we've all heard of it, don't worry about it. Hardware will get faster and we'll swear out the problem later. You don't need to worry about the efficiency of your software. It was a very common thing. It become a meme. I, got involved in many projects where people say, oh, don't worry, we'll just upgrade to the latest hardware and it gets faster. People got used to that. And this continued for many decades going forward. The CPUs did get a lot faster. We could just wait and things picked up. There's a period of about five decades in computing where we got six orders of magnitude increase in performance. So nothing else in history has seen that sort of advances. So we get used to this way of thinking. But things started to change, particularly around about 2005. Herb Sutter came out with this great paper called about the free lunch is over. What he had realized at this point is we had hit a wall. This whole great time we had been having of CPUs doubling in performance roughly every 18 months came just slammed into a wall. And that wall was heat dissipation. We were making our CPUs faster and faster by increasing the clock speed and we increase the clock speed by increasing the voltage. There's a little bit of a problem with this. Every time you increase the voltage, you increase the amount of heat you produce as a, as a cubic function of the amount of voltage you put into it. 
that ends up with a real serious issue in the end. And so we were getting to around the sort of four gigahertz to five gigahertz range where things were getting pushed, and we just couldn't dissipate the heat. So we had to back off from there. So we get stuck at around four to five gigahertz as the absolute maximum, but three gigahertz being a practical maximum for what was going on. That was from 2005 onwards. So we started, okay, multi-core is the answer. We're going to have to go parallel. That's the way we'll get better at this. But interesting, the original Moore's Law still holds. And that was about transistor density was doubling every two years. What happened over that period is we still got all of those extra transistors. Some of it went to cores, but not as much as we thought. Much more of that transistor budget went into building bigger caches, smarter caches, branch predictors, out of order speculation engines, our CPUs became incredibly complex. They started doing very smart, intelligent things. Some of the very latest AMD CPUs have got machine learning inside them for branch prediction. That's where we're now at these days. All of that transistor budget was going into there, and we went full on with that, still rushing ahead. And then last year, Google made a discovery, and this year, we've been dealing with some of that. But just before we reached this stage, we also started coming up with another interesting problem is Intel realized as we kept shrinking our CPUs, it got difficult. And 2016, they officially dropped TikTok. So Moore's Law ended. We'd seen in 2005 that what most people think Moore's Law means ended, but the real Moore's Law ended at this period. So We've now got the stage where we don't have the extra CPUs, we don't have the extra logic to put into these, and we don't have the clock speed. So we've just really tailed off. So as things got faster, we had an inflection 2005 where the second derivative changed. It then come to a screeching halt in 2016. And then with Google's discovery, we actually went backwards. We discovered that a lot of what we had invested in wasn't working because it was full of security flaws. And now we've seen over the last year that as we've implemented the patches, our servers have got slower and slower. So the world is now very different from the world that many of us grew up in, many of us got used to programming for. And this whole thing about don't worry about performance, it'll just be dealt with with the next generation. That's over. We are now in a different world that we have to think differently about this. So we're going to, have to go back and do some different things. So are we back to worrying about concurrency and parallelism? Is that going to be the answer? Let's have a look into those two and see what they mean. And just for reference, to make sort of people clear on this, concurrency and parallelism are two very different things. I love the definition so that sort of go in and describe this. So Rob Pike, who's running the Go programming languages, he talks about concurrency is having to deal with multiple things at the same time whereas normal parallelism is doing multiple things at the same time. As long as there's no relationship between those things, happening in parallel is actually fairly easy. So scaling up in parallel, fairly easy. Scaling up concurrently, not so easy because we're dealing with certain complexity. Let's see how some of this complexity plays out. So where I met Morton last year was in India. Got some interesting photographs of India. If you've never been, it's really worth visiting. Fascinating place. Road system is a complete nightmare. You think Belfast traffic's bad? I live in London these days, and it's pretty bad. But nothing prepared me for India. And what's the problem here is we have a shared resource being the road, and it's being used by far more people than it was ever designed for. So we've just got this nightmare of how do we manage this. And like, you try certain things to help it out. Like for example, there's a traffic light. It's red. Does it make any difference at all? <laughs> That's like a lot of software I see. It just looks like that. When people use threads, it's pretty much what it ends up looking like inside the software. Do we really want to end up there? Now, I guess everyone's heard of uh, Gene Amdahl and Amdahl's Law. So he wrote a paper, it was actually called Amdahl's Argument, and he was talking about how this rush to going parallel is not a good idea. The whole point of his paper and his argument was to scare people off doing parallel programming, because he didn't want people doing parallel programming and buying mid-range computers. He wanted to sell his mainframes that had fast single-core processors. 
He's now been associated with parallel programming. He'll be turning in his grave now, which is a little bit unfortunate, but he didn't want people to do this. His paper pointed out some interesting flaws, but it was incomplete. He wasn't actually trying to do serious research in the area. He was trying to just discourage people from doing parallel concurrent programming. Some people who did look into this in more detail, including Neil Gunther at Xerox Park, made a really interesting discovery. He came up with this law, universal scalability law. It encompasses Amdahl's law. So the contention part of this, the alpha in the formula, what he's talking about is if you've got any given algorithm, if some part of it is contended between different threads, it becomes the fundamental limiting factor when we try to scale up. As Neil implemented systems and tried to track them with this, he discovered that this wasn't sufficient. There was actually something else going on, and he realized there was a second major component, and that is the contention penalty. It's the time to reach agreement. Nothing happens instantaneously. It takes time to disseminate information, and this starts to become a cost as well. If you plug some figures into this formula, what does it look like? So I want to take an example. I've got a job, and 95% of it can be done parallel. People think, that's brilliant. That's a great candidate for scaling up. But we're going to add a coherence penalty of 150 microseconds to get the state disseminated against the processors that are involved or the machines that are involved. This is what we typically see in a cluster these days. We get this graph if we plot that. So we throw processors at the problem. Things speed up looking better, but you start to see it becomes limited. And eventually, you will never get more than a 20x speed up, even if just 5% of the algorithms contended. Then notice how the coherence penalty starts off just tracking Amdahl's law and then starts to dominate and take over. And if you start throwing loads of processors at it, it actually gets much worse. So it's not an easy way out to go concurrent. It is an option, but it's extremely limited, and you have to deal with the contention and the coherence inside this. So what other options do we have if we don't want to go this way? We can look at, well, what would it be like if we just do single-threaded? We'll go at a single resource. What other things come into play? Well, that's everybody go the same way. Unfortunately, you can overload a lot on the resource. And again, this is the road into Delhi. I went and visited Delhi after being in Bangalore. If you suffer from asthma, do not go to Delhi. <laughs> this is incredibly clear day. You could not have seen more than about seven or eight cars in front. And some of the time that I was there, it's a horribly, horribly polluted place. But it's just totally saturated. And when things are totally saturated, there's some other interesting mathematics come into play as well. And so even if you're writing single-threaded code, we can have issues. What are some of the laws behind some of this? So again, this is like mathematics that goes back 100 years ago. Work of Erlang, queuing theory comes into play here. If we start increasing the utilization of any given resource, we end up queuing, waiting to use this. And we get this interesting J curve that happens in almost any resource we start to use. So if we're only using something 50%, the chances of it being in use when we need to use it is only 50%. So we're actually doing pretty well. But this starts to compound and goes up there quite quickly. The math behind this, again, pretty simple for that type of thing. But kind of fundamentally, the row in this about the utilization, it's a function of the arrival rate and the service time. And the service time I'm going to come back to again. So it's basically how efficient is the single thing that you're doing. So if you're writing on a single thread, you still have to be efficient. Do you want to run away from concurrency? Great. It's something you really should do but you only do it if you're also going to be efficient with that single resource that you got, or it comes to bite you on these things. So this is if you're going to turn up and deal with it. What if we're trying to deal with something at a constant rate? So things are flowing. We want to go fast at something. So we want to drink from the fire hose. The math from 100 years ago was nicely simplified 50 years ago with John Little when he came up with a thing called Little's Law. A beautiful little piece of mathematics that describes how so many systems work. Where you've got the work in progress is the throughput times the cycle time. I see this math everywhere. It comes under lots of different names. We see it in many different places. 
And actually, this is a very common thing across much of what we do, and this shows how sort of nascent we are as an industry. Anyone heard of Brooks' Law? To Fred Brooks' book on the Mythical Man Month? Brooks's law, if you actually look at it and you study the universal scalability law, they both discovered the same thing and called it two different names. In two different contexts, but it's the same mathematics that underlie both of them. Kind of fascinating what's there. So Little's law, you'll see like this. A lot of agile that people are talking about, it's actually fundamentally based upon Little's law as well. So if people say, you're working in your organization and you're agile, and they say, well, what does it mean to be agile? Well, we do scrum and we do stand-ups and stuff and all every morning. That's all just ceremony. The real basis behind agile is Little's Law and how to be responsive as an organization. Another example where it turns up a lot is networking. I spend a lot of time writing networking code, and there's this formula is applied all over the place. It's called bandwidth delay product. This is how you work out what size your buffers need to be. Most loss that occurs in networking is incorrectly sized buffers. To know how to size your buffers, it's this very simple calculation. You know the bandwidth of your network, and you know the round trip latency. From there, you can work out the number of bytes that are in flight. That's the number of bytes that are in your pipe at any given point, and that's the size your buffers need to be to send at full rate or receive at full rate. Very simple math. Now, what about our memory subsystem, it's just the network from the chip to our DRAM memory. How much bandwidth can we get through this? Well, if we just apply a very simple calculation, let's say I want to write bytes out to main memory. Say they're large words, they're 64-bit integers. I can track 10 cache misses per CPU at any given time, because there's 10 line feed buffers per Intel x86 processor. If I take the latency to memory to be an average of 100 nanoseconds, I can only get 800 megabytes per second. So if I'm running on a single CPU core, and I'm randomly accessing memory like this, I can only get 800 megabytes per second per core. That is a small fraction of what our servers are capable of. So you're totally wasting the hardware. This is why we've got the staggering gains of the computer hardware industry wasted by programmers not knowing what they're doing with this hardware, because they un understand the basic mathematics of how to use it. I'm going to come back to this formula again and show how we can utilize this much, much better. So let's look at memory itself and how can we get good things out of it. If we want to be good engineers, we've got to measure. And measurement is the thing that guides us better than anything else. We don't just guess. We don't take random goes at stuff. We've got to do it based upon measurement. I love Feynman's quote around, it doesn't matter how smart you are, how great an idea you come up with. If your idea cannot be approved by experimental evidence, it's just a guess. So we've got to measure. We've got to work this way. So let's have a bit of a theory here. Are all memory operations equal? So if I'm going to access memory from my CPU, it should be all equal. We're all told this, that you go to memory, it's random access, it's the same time, regardless of how we do it. Let's test that theory and see how it actually stacks up. So let's say I want to go through memory completely sequentially. I have a large chunk of memory, and I'm going to go through every byte or every word in a sequential fashion. A good example to do this is have a large array. Let's say I make it one gigabyte in size, something bigger than it'll fit in your local CPU cache. I'm going to go through and I'm going to sum up all of the values in that array. That's going to be a nice sequential access to this. How long do we think that will take in nanoseconds per operation on average to go through that array? Anybody any ideas? Guesses? Anybody for a microsecond, millisecond, nanosecond? How many of them? Seven of what type? <laughs> Seven nanoseconds to go to memory per thing. Do you know what the average access time is to me in memory? Ah, okay. If I give you a clue, it's in the order of 100 nanoseconds for a single access to memory. If you're going to iterate through in an array and you deal with it, 
It's got to be a bit more than that. Maybe, maybe not. Let's write an experiment and measure it and see what answer we get. So I'm going to benchmark this. What does the benchmark show me? Well, it actually shows me that the average access time per element of this, and this is the total time for the benchmark. This is the load the value, increment the step along the array, sum up the previous value, multiple steps per operation. It turns out at less than one nanosecond per operation on a three gigahertz CPU. Hang on, that doesn't make any sense. It takes much longer than that to get to memory. And actually, there's multiple instructions per step going along the array. What's going on here? Really, you've got to ask this question. What is going on is a thing called instruction-level parallelism. A lot of what the transistors in our CPUs have gone into is making quite complex CPUs that are doing many things in parallel at the same time, even on a single thread. How does this play out? This is the inside of a Haswell uh, back end of its processor for an Intel. This is as of about 2015. Things have advanced further since then. So 2015, you have a scheduler inside your single CPU. This is not an operating system scheduler. This is inside a CPU. It has got eight ports on that scheduler. Each of those ports are connected to execution units that can be executing instructions at the same time in parallel and doing them out of order. So the fetching of the value from the index that you're being addressed in the array is happening on one of these ports. The summation of the previous value, the summation to be the next index you're going to access, this is all happening at the same time, and it's pipelined. So we're actually seeing we're going through an array at less than one nanosecond per operation. Let's see how it plays out with some other choices. How about if I stay within an operating system page and I randomly walk around this? I'm going to use a lot of those execution units to create a very simple random function. It's enough to overcome some of the smarts in the CPU system for this cache, but not too taxing and going to use up too much CPU resource. So I'm randomly going to walk around inside the operating system page. I'm now up 2.7 nanoseconds per operation, so it's slowed down a little bit but not significantly. Now, what if I take a random step, but I can't take the random step until I've resolved the previous value, and the previous value feeds in as a seed to the random function to the next step? It slows down a bit more now. Now, my CPU can't speculate, because what it could do before is, it could speculate, do this step, and speculate the next step, and speculate the next step, and keep going and resolve all of those at the same time. That's what a lot of the transistor budget's going into. We're up to seven nanoseconds to do that. But I'm still staying within the same operating system page. This is important because we address our memory as virtual addresses, but it has to be physically backed up in our CPUs. So there has to be a translation from the virtual to the physical addressing. If we stay within the same operating system page, that address mapping is cached, and so we save some time. Now let's go randomly around the whole a large array going from one slot to another. We slow down even more at this stage. So we're up to about 20 nanoseconds. But notice that there's no dependency between these steps when we go to random. So let's put the dependency back again. So random with the dependency on the previous step. And now we're up to 89 nanoseconds. So memory's all the same, is it? All memory operations are equal? No. You'll discover that if you measure virtually all types of memory subsystems, and by memory subsystem, I'm using it generically as our hardware friends use the term. I mean caches, main memory, going to disk, going to SSDs. If you treat them like tape and you go through them sequentially, they're super fast. You go at them with any random or arbitrary pattern, they slow down massively. Orders of magnitude slow down. So not all memory accesses are the same. We've got to think about this. So just reinforce that. Like, so that's approximately 90 nanoseconds. That is on an incredibly fast machine. It gets much worse than that. And that is within the single CPU socket or CPU core. Because it's different on our servers, your typical server is going to have multiple CPU sockets 
Look, we plug our CPU sockets into these things. These are memory banks. So this is a motherboard that's got four CPU sockets. There's a network between those, and the steps in those networks add hundreds of nanoseconds on top of that. So again, these values get even more. So your access patterns start to really matter. It makes a big difference. Think of this another way. If you have a cache miss, a cache miss is roughly 100 nanoseconds, say, on average. That is a lost opportunity to have executed typically at least 1,000 CPU instructions. Now, how do I get to 1,000 as a value? If you think about that CPU that I showed you the picture with eight execution units, those CPUs can typically retire four CPU instructions per cycle. You could be running a three gigahertz machine, which is three billion instructions per second, running four of those being retired per cycle and waiting for 100 nanoseconds. That's 1,200 missed. And if you have higher clock speed, it's even more. So where you spend your time really matters. Cache misses matter much more than CPU instructions these days. And we've been that way now for about 10 years. And it's getting to be more and more so all the time. We talk about the memory wall, with the gap between CPU performance and memory performance just keeps getting greater and greater, and it keeps continuing this way. So let's look at some algorithms and data structures, and what are the implications of some of this for what we do. Well, back to Little's Law. We've seen that we can only get 800 megabytes per second with basic Little's Law. Well, I have three variables I can change here. If I want to make this better, I have to change one of them. I want to get better bandwidth, so I want to get better throughput to my memory. So I'm not changing that. That leaves me two other things I can change. My bytes, I can send, or the latency to memory. Can we change the latency to memory? Is that possible? Well, our CPUs are smart. One of the things that in the CAT subsystem they've got is prefetchers. If you know the pattern of access to memory that can be prefetched, we can get it faster. So if we can prefetch the memory into the L3 cache, we drop that latency to 15 nanoseconds. Now we can run at 5.3 gigabytes per second. That's gone a little bit further. Can I improve the bytes to this? Well, yes, I can. Because our memory is not just fetched in words, it's fetched in cache lines. And cache lines are 64 bytes at a time. And we can have 10 of those in flight at any given point in time. So now if I do 640 at that sort of latency, I can be dragging in over 40 gigabytes per second per core into the CPU. This way we can get much better throughput or for bandwidth. And that's taking advantage of the prefetchers and prefetching for cache lines. To do that, the only data structure that does that really well is an array. If you straight through an array, you can go at incredibly high rates. You won't get 40 gigabytes per second because as you're pulling stuff into the cache, you're evicting stuff out. There's lots of other things going on at the same time. If you get between 10 and 20 gigabytes per core, you're doing pretty well. But that's a lot better than 800 megabytes. So it starts to make a big difference. So arrays are the most efficient data structure to traverse. It's a really important thing. You see that a lot in high-frequency trading, and I'll come back to that again. Now, you're in Northern Ireland. I remember growing up here, lots of sausages. People make good sausages here. Little confession, as a student, I worked in an abattoir. <laughs> That's how I got through university with no debts. I know it's inside. I know it's inside sausages. I also know it's inside data structures because I've made a lot of them. And I've been responsible for building functional data structures. And I like this way of thinking about them. If you look inside them, you do not sleep very well. <laughs> this is quite a common thing. The problem is most of our functional data structures are all built like trees and linked lists. Those are the worst data structures for getting good performance out of memory. So you've got to think about how we use them, how we deal with them well. There's a great wealth of research that should be done and can be done in making functional data structures much more efficient. I happen to have done a lot of work in this space for doing distributed data structures. 
And we've got great evidence that shows you you can get phenomenal throughput and great performance if you have some machine sympathy as well as an understanding of how you want to build your data structure. So come back to that a little bit. Now, branches is something that's worth talking about. It. Within our CPUs, yes, we've got this speed of accessing memory. That's one consideration. We have conditionals. Conditionals are happening all of the time. So if we look at the typical Haswell CPU, you'll notice on this we have got four LUs. There's an integer, an integer. We've got the ability to store, store data. We've got another integer, another integer, and store addresses. So four units that are your traditional ALUs that are in there. But what's kind of interesting here is like, so the yellow bits are what was new from the previous generation. We got a new branch unit here, and we had a branch unit over here. Your conditional work is all done with your branch units. You have less of those than you have got ALUs to do arithmetic. So branches are going to have higher utilization if you use those much more. But on top of that, they also have a cost because they end up predicting. We do a lot of stuff with prediction, and it can go wrong. And now with the Google discoveries and the meltdown and the specter patches, it's got much slower. So let's test some of this. So I'm going to get an array, and I'm going to fill an array with natural numbers. Start with zero, go on up. Oh, sorry, just really simple positive integers. And if I do a baseline test where I'm going to go through and I'm going to consume the numbers if they're greater than or equal to zero, that's always going to be true in this case as a conditional. That gives me a baseline. Now let's make it a little bit interesting. Like I'm going to consume odd and even numbers in interesting ways, but it's a predictable pattern. So it's something the CPU can learn very easily. What happens to the performance in here? Well, the predictable pattern is roughly about the same. See, there's a bit of noise in the figures here. You see the error bar is a little bit higher in the predictable. The baseline is very predictable, so there's very little noise in it. But we start to see it's roughly the same throughput. And what I'm looking at here is I want to take the time for iterating through a gigabyte of an array and consuming the, the values dependent upon whether they're needed or not. Now, let's make it unpredictable. I take that in array and I shuffle it. So all of the numbers are now randomly organized in it, and I'll consume them deciding on whether they're even or odd, but I don't know what they're like. How long does it take to go through this? Doing exactly the same work as the other two cases. Now we notice it's got a lot slower. It's a factor of four difference. So how predictable our code is starts to make a big difference as well. So these branch units are very good, but they need to be predictable in how we deal with them. So what can we do in our code? What sort of things can we think about? We want to make the best utilization of that data pipe that we have to our main memory. So if we can get 10 gigabytes or even up to 20 gigabytes per second, if we're going to use it really well, could we get even more out of it? Well, common techniques, and I know that this is sort of something that the APL community are already doing, we can start using bits for Booleans. Most languages will use a byte for a Boolean. That's a waste of seven bits. If you use a bit for each of the Booleans, we can go through the memory now eight times faster because eight times less of it. And we can do great things in counting on that. So let's say I want to do a, a count of a given population that meets some criteria. If I go through, I have to shift and mask, shift and mask for to find which bits are set in each byte to do that. If you're on Intel x86 and you know that, it's got a CPU instruction called pop count, which will give you the population count inside a given word, up to a 64-bit word. So you can count 64 Booleans in a single instruction that takes one cycle and whiz through memory. These are the sort of things you can start to do if those things are available to you. You can go further than that. 64-bit is very common these days, but we've also got larger registers. We've got SIMD, then we've got the AVX, now we've got AVX2. We're now up to 512 bits. We can go wide for some of these instructions. That's a lot of things we can be doing at the same time. So scanning through, single cycle, working through all these instructions very, very fast. The important thing is to start thinking about how we apply math at this stage and how do we get these data dependencies broken. Because see these complex CPUs, 
they're speculating, they're doing stuff out of order. How can we help them to do parallel stuff much better on a single thread? Well, kind of going back to this again, what you got to think about is the math that we use. Start coming up with math that is both commutative and associative, then it can be done in parallel. Commutative doesn't matter if we swap around the arguments in any order. If it's associative, we can group them in any order. We can get much greater throughput through this. So start changing as much of your math as you can to be additions and multiplications and steer away from subtractions and divisions. We can get much more through our CPUs. And also division is very expensive as an operation on its own. Pretty much all other math is very cheap. Division is very expensive. Like two orders of magnitude more than an addition in its cost on our CPU. So kind of be aware of that. Arrays, this is a kind of classic one we see in games programming. Is sort them even if you don't require them to be sorted because you start processing and there's a lot you can do afterwards. You'll end up making things more predictable. You can actually group functions that hang off that. Classic one in games programming is you sort a whole array and you're going to take actions based upon something. You'll do the same action on the same group, then you move on to do a different action on another group and another. You're keeping stuff together. You're benefiting from how your caches work. And there's great stuff from the past. I, I love a lot of the work of Leslie Lamport. My specialization is concurrent parallel programming. He blazed the trail in this area, did a lot of great work in distributed systems. He also has done loads of really cool work in processing arrays of data as well. So here's a great paper, 1975, he got in there. And what he's talking about here is how we can do multiple processing on single words. And he was talking about sort of dealing with 16 and 32-bit machines. Now we've got 64-bit machines and getting benefits out of this. He reviewed this paper again in 2011, and he says, like, this neat hack was really good then, but it's even better now for two reasons. First obvious reason is the word sizes are now bigger, but even more so is this other thing that hasn't become so obvious to many people, but is now becoming that, is that the conditional operations in a lot of what he was doing in math can be done with masking rather than branching. And now, Branching is much more costly than it even was in the 1970s. So a lot of the ideas that we learned in the 1970s are even more applicable now than they were back then. So we're moving on. There's lots more we can do. There's loads of other gems from back then. I feel like going back, I've reached the stage in my life, so I'm about to turn 50, and I'm sort of realizing that most of the music now, I'm not liking it. I'm finding great music by going back. I'm finding that in technology as well. There's great stuff in the past that we have forgotten about. We just need to dig it up again and get back to it because we just kind of forgot and moved on to new fluffy, trendy stuff that isn't quite so good. And here's another great one. So this is like 78. Like how to count very large numbers in small registers by counting logarithms. Again, real beauties and gems, simple stuff that just works so well. So just, I'm just giving you some inspiration. Go look into the past. There's some great stuff that's out there. And like... How do we work with our CPU caches? I'm going to try and pick up the pace here so I finish and start a little bit late. When you work your CPU cache, you've got to consider three things. There's a lot of complexity to learn, but you need to learn three things. One is you need to use things temporally. So group things together in time. That's the kind of obvious thing that most people get from caches. What are some of the less obvious things? Well, you need to think about things spatially. So group things together in space that are going to be used. So that way we'll benefit from the operating system pages, from cache lines, from whatever. And this is where like, arrays are particularly good because you keep everything spatially together. It really helps. And then the last bit of this is group them together and think about patterns. If your patterns of access are predictable, there's a lot can be done. That's where a lot of the smarts have gone into our CPUs these days. So how do we put this together? You can learn lots about the detail. That's great and it's interesting. But if you want to get the sort of quick takeaway, sort of follow these sorts of things when you think about what you're dealing with. We need to batch up. Some things are expensive. If they're expensive, how do we get the benefits from them? We've got to put things into batches. Again, a kind of old technique that's still very applicable today. Look at the math behind batching. Do you need to put a 1,000 things into a batch to get the benefits? If we look at... So something takes a unit of time. If you put two things into the same batch, you've now taken that main cost and it's 50% amortized for each of the elements in that. You go to four, 
You go down, it just gets better and better, but it peels off. The biggest win you get on batches is going from one to two. So you don't need to get carried away with some of the stuff. It actually works really well and applies across many different things. So putting multiple things into words, multiple things into cash lines, multiple things into lots of different units. And these blocks will appear and the title of the talk will become obvious very soon. So very quickly in closing, how do we sort of think about some of this and what do we need to wrap up? First thing you've got to do is profile. You've got to test and profile because you've got to stop doing stuff based upon an opinion. This is how we move forward as an industry. We've got to measure. If your environment does not have good profilers, beat on the people who make the tools for your environment and say, give us good profilers. It is so important to doing the right thing because you can then drive good decisions off this. I've seen this across various communities whereby the ones that have got the good tooling that are backing this up make much more progress than the ones that don't. It's almost like languages don't matter as much as the tooling does that sits around them. These things start to become obvious. You'll see where there's waste. You'll see where you can eliminate it. Like duplication is a classic problem that we'll see everywhere. You'll see stuff you can put into batches to amateurize. You'll see where you get your bad access patterns and we can do that better. Start favoring math in places rather than branches, and at least try to be predictable. This is just the simple stuff you do to make stuff quite fast, and it tends to work really well. And if you do it all really well, the thing you'll start to think about is, well, ultimately we do need to go parallel. Well, you can't look at that one of two ways. There's the instruction level parallelism that we've been talking about. We can get a lot of benefits from that, and then you start looking at task level parallelism. Now, note I did not say concurrency. <laughs> Stay away from concurrency. I'm a big fan of Billy Connolly, and I love his quote about people who want to be in politics or own a gun should be automatically barred. I think it's the same about concurrency. Anybody who wants to do concurrency should be automatically barred from it. And we should leave it to the people who really don't want to do it because they know what they're dealing with and the complexity that's in there. But task level parallelism is a different thing. It's a much simpler, much more elegant way of doing this. And say, searching and sorting and all sorts of cool things on large data structures works very nice in this space. So, kind of wrapping up, how does all this stuff work? We're built on this incredible levels of complexity and incredible levels of abstractions. Often they're kind of wrong. And so, like, like, is this turtles all of the way down? Well, it's kind of where the title of this is. It's actually rectangles all of the way down. At pretty much every level, we end up dealing with rectangles. We've got frames to the network. We've got pages in our operating systems. We've got blocks going to our storage. We're dealing with cache lines. There's all of these things. They're all rectangles at the end of it all. And how we deal with them, and those are the units that we are basically spending our performance budget on. Make sure we use all of those units really well. And then we get very cool things out as a result. Because even in the languages, we have arrays. But the really interesting data structures that are out there are usually made up of lots of little arrays associated together in interesting little ways. So I'll leave you with this quote. I had so I'd work a lot in the HFT space, and people argue about data structures. And I know one guy who made this quote once when we were arguing about how to deal with things well in a market. And he says, I don't care what data structure you use, nothing beats an array. And I have seen this work out in some of the systems where we're dealing in microseconds to react to things, dealing at hundreds of thousands of events per second, and it works really well. And on that, I'll thank you very much.